thing to be in the house of the Lord. I thank God for the opportunity to come in here and just engage you in the word. I thank God for this Sunday morning worship time. I pray and ask Middle Belt family that you guys will be blessed. Also those who are listening online, we pray and ask that you be blessed by our sermon time and worship time this day. I'm going to start off by coming right out of Psalm 115, just so we read scripture, because scripture kind of grounds our service. And he says this, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name, I'm going to give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet that cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throats. Those who make them are just like them, as are all who trust in them. Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. He who fears the Lord, trust the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. Dear Lord, I pray as we open this service up that you'll be with us, that you'll walk with us, talk with us, open our hearts to hear your word, Lord, for it is you we need to hear from right now. Particularly these times, we need to hear from you and you alone. Slow us down, Lord, so we can hear you clearly. I pray these things in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, family. Pastor Hood here, sheltering in place. Before we go to prayer, I'm going to read something to you. Uh, let's call it food for thought. Give a listen. For the next 60 days, the Christian Evangelistic Gospel Assemblies will be put to the test to ensure our tribulation protocols are properly in place. So in the event of a real disaster, the world will know where to turn in their general and immediate locations. Stay tuned to Middle Belt Baptist for further breaking news and information pertaining to the word of God and the world around us. In the event and before a real disaster occurs, we want you to know where to turn and who to turn to. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, it's your name that is honored from generation to generation. You alone are worthy of all glory and praise. You are Savior and sustainer of life, truly worthy to be praised, magnified, and glorified. So today, we are proclaiming at Middle Belt Church, we will glorify you through this pandemic, that your name will be known and praised throughout this city. For we know you are not at a loss about what to do because nothing is impossible for you. We know you have made a way out of no way for your children. So help us, O oh God, to pierce the darkness with your light. Help us, your children, to shine brighter than the fear of death or economic ruin, to shine brighter than the woes and worries of this world. And through us, may you use us in unique ways to create hope during this time of quarantine as we begin implementing our electronic ministry of constant contact. Allow us in this season to shine bright and strengthen your church, reminding them through you that you have this. God's got this family. We thank you for the opportunity to spread your love and hope to a world living in darkness and despair. When we look back on this moment in history, I pray the church will stand tall and proud for the courage, the compassion, and the confidence we demonstrated during this season of cleansing. I pray we will be filled with joy as we remember the revival of family, the revival of hope, the revival of hearts turning towards you. With hope and finding peace as we come out of this season, I pray that many will find that hope, will find that peace in, with, and through you. Lord, if they're looking for peace, they can only find it through your grace. Please heal our land and use us to meet the needs of others. Grow our faith as we attempt to grow your church. Continue to instill in us, Lord, the wisdom as to how to draw this hurting, confused, lost world back to you. Without doubt, all authority is yours, O oh Lord, but you have given authority to leaders to protect and guide us. Today, we ask that you would give all of our leaders wisdom, discernment, strength, and resolve. Keep them healthy, safe, and rested so they can continue to guide us through these perilous times. 
give our government leaders wisdom about what needs to be done to stop the virus and stabilize our economy. Help them to look more at the people than the pocket. Give our spiritual leaders your under shepherds discernment as to what to say to comfort and calm the hearts of members and to show us how to meet people's needs as we continue to glorify your name and encourage the church through our works. Give our medical leaders, people like Dr. Fucci and the director of the World Health Organization, give them insight. Not only them, Lord, give the doctors as a whole insight into how to contain and overcome this virus. Strengthen their resolve and honor their hard work in creating a treatment to defeat this foe. I pray you give our civic leaders inspiration, courage, and strength. Strength to meet the needs of their communities. May there be no lack in Michigan, Lord. Strengthen our mayor and our governor to continue the work and to think continuously, thinking outside of the box. Now, Lord, as we hold up in high esteem and raise our voices as one people, we intercede in prayer and petition for our first responders, our firemen, our police officers, our EMS teams, our emergency room employees, and the techs, our nurses, doctors, and their medical support teams, our 911 operators. The men and women on the front line knee deep in this battle. Lord, watch over them. We thank you, <clears throat> we thank you for them. And we pray for your presence, peace, and protection to be with them. Give them all wisdom and stamina to endure. We are so grateful for these men and women. We pray for their strength. We pray their strength in Jesus' name. And last but not least, Lord, help us, your Christian leaders. Help us to be good leaders in our communities, in our congregation, in our assemblies. Help us to display courage, generosity, and empathy. I pray that in the way we honor others, we will inspire those around us. Lord, all these things I pray in the master's name of our creator, our sustainer, and giver of life, Christ Jesus. Let every heart say amen. Saints, I have a small little sermon series to help us during this time. Um, I'm going to title that sermon series, Suffering in light of eternity. Suffering in light of eternity. We'll be coming out of Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 25. Let me read. It says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope, we've been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what they've already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. Saints, we came out of Romans today, and I just want to lift up Christ as we go into the Word. Lord, help us today as we try to get in this scripture and just kind of squeeze out any truths that we can from it. We need you to open our ears and hearts to receive that for which we cannot do on our own. I pray that in thy son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, um, I have three biological daughters of my own, and, and the oldest of them, Ryan, uh, she was born. And when she was born, we decided that uh, my wife would get an epidural. And we did the practice. I read the book on pregnancy and what my job was as the coach. My job was to make her breathe during the contractions. And so I kind of read about it. I didn't know any better. So I read and I practiced. And so I was ready for that first birth. When we went in, my wife was already at three centimeters. And when you get to four centimeters, you can no longer have the epidural. So we got there just in time. We got there with the epidural and... Once they put that in, 
I was waiting for these contractions to come and for me to use my coaching skills. That never came. It didn't come primarily because the epidural helped her deal with the pain. And then she had the baby. And I'm like, wow, that was easy. I couldn't help but think about all the stories I've heard about women in pain. I didn't recognize that, you know, the epidural that, in a sense, masked some of the pain. Then with our second child together, Kennedy, we decided before we had her that we wouldn't use any medication. Well, actually, we decided, but kind of she decided, and I just agree with my wife. And she decided she wouldn't use medication. And so this time I figured I would come with the same kind of coaching experience that I did before. I didn't think it would be much different. But this was a whole different childbirth. I can remember I heard my wife scream in ways I've never heard her scream before. Many people in the hallway thought she was dying from the pain of having that baby. My coaching skills had to kick in. I was busy the whole childbirth. Before, I was sitting down watching TV with the first one, but this one I couldn't sit down. I had to stay with her the whole time. I remember during that process, she had to go to the bathroom, and I couldn't help her, and I helped her to the bathroom and let her go uh, to the bathroom, the restroom, and next thing you know, she started having a contraction in the bathroom. I had to come get her and put her back in the bed. This was a totally different pregnancy. It made me understand human pain. It made me understand actually the curse that you find in Genesis chapter three. It made me understand the pain that, that was involved with bearing a child and actually childbirth itself. In some ways, you guys, human suffering is often in the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, described as birth pains. Let me give you something to hang your hat on today. It says this, human suffering is one of the methods used by God to detach us from this world so that we can keep our focus towards eternity. My objective in this small series is to help you see that human suffering is one of the methods God uses to detach us from this world so we can get our focus towards eternity. Dear saints, I'm convinced that if God didn't bring suffering into our lives, trouble into our lives, hard times and calamity into our lives, we would never leave here. We would be like a baby in a womb. A baby in a womb would prefer to stay in his mother's stomach or a, she he would prefer or she would prefer to stay in the comforts of that beautiful cocoon that God gave them in, in, in a mama's stomach, eating and quiet and taking care of. But, but that childbirth is a violent experience it's a forcing out, it's a pushing out to a new dimension. So human suffering causes us to, to hold less onto things on this side and to look, keep our focus towards eternity. Now, another thing happened to me that reminds me of my own sin and that I'm in a broken body. I lasted a long time, y'all. Forty Just turned 47 this year and I had to finally get glasses. I'm turning 47 this year. I had to finally get glasses. And that's been troublesome for me. It's been troublesome for me because I lasted my whole life not having to get contacts nor glasses. But at night now, on the expressway, I started to notice something. And I couldn't see exit signs that were far down the road. So eventually I had to tell Corey, who was sitting next to me, I say, Bad, I, something ain't right. I can't see the things I used to see. She smiles and almost laughs and says, it's not, yeah, there's something wrong. You need glasses. I got an attitude, but eventually I had to get glasses. But what glasses did for me, though, at night when I'm on the expressway and my eyesight fails me and I'm unable to see with any clarity anymore, this requires an outside source to help me see what I couldn't see before. I can't produce it anymore. I can't see it. There's nothing humanly possible for me to do to get myself to see better. So I need an outside source, a mechanism, so I can see what I couldn't see before. That outside source is in the armrest of my car, and that's when I pull out my glasses. When I pull out my glasses, y'all, I can see things that I haven't seen before. I can see the exits miles up. I can see them clear in all the signs. So the first point I want to give you in this scripture, come out of verse 18, is put on your glasses. 
Your glasses, in this case, will help you to see what you couldn't see before. Your glasses, in this case, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to help you see some things you couldn't see before. Where we, were, where, we, where, where we couldn't see, where we didn't have clarity, it is his job to bring clarity where we can't see. Let's look at this verse right here, verse 18. It says this, for I consider. Paul starts up this section with a powerful conclusion to a long discourse that started in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Romans 118, he said this, the wrath of God is revealed. Then he lists several behaviors, y'all, that give indication that the wrath of God has already been revealed to mankind. He showed us that when you see these behaviors manifested, I'm not about to judge. You are already under judgment. At that time, Paul is writing to the church of Rome, which is the center of the only world superpower. At this time, this is also the, one of the biggest churches. In, in, uh, in the New Testament time, and it's in a place that is fully pagan. He takes us then to chapter 6, and he shows us that we're not to present our members of instruments of unrighteousness. In other words, in chapter 6, he said, don't use your, your mind, your feet, your ears, your hands, your nose, your senses for unrighteousness, but use them, on the other hand, for God. In other words, Paul's expectation in chapter 6 is instead of using all of those members to do evil, he wants you to now use them for the Lord. But then in uh, chapter 7, Paul gets real transparent, y'all. He gets transparent about his spiritual journey and how he was, he was beginning to understand that there was a battle going on between his body and his spirit. You see, prior to salvation with Paul, there was no battle going on between his body and spirit because they were both pursuing the same things. Paul is basically saying in chapter 7 that by willpower or the flesh, you can't have victory over the flesh. The more you try to do this, the more you'll see it. And that's because you cannot defeat the flesh with the flesh. Are you following me? Paul is saying in this chapter 7 here, he said, the things I don't want to do, those are the things I'm doing. The things that, that, that in the inward man I delight to to the law of God. I delight you in my spirit, Lord, but it seems like something's going on in my flesh that's keeping me from fully obeying you to the point that I want to. Paul has basically begun to understand now that there's a battle going on between his spirit and his flesh. Now, chapter 7, I'm going to give you some time. I want you to turn to chapter 7, verse 21 through 25. Romans 7, 21 through 25. It's a battle going on. Paul didn't see it before. But as a new believer, he's starting to see it. As an unsaved person, he didn't see it. Remember this. It's a key point. He didn't see it because both his spirit and flesh were going the same direction. But when Paul gave his life to Christ, his spirit now was made alive, but his flesh is still decaying and dying. Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, verse 21 through 25. I've discovered a law. When I want to do good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. Look at verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God. But with my flesh, the law of sin. Watch verse 21. Paul said, I discovered something, y'all. I, I discovered something I didn't know. He said, evil is present in the one who wants to do good. Y'all, let's just look at that, that, that verse or that, that summary. This is not cutting-edge knowledge. Paul knew already about the inherent depravity of man. We know that because in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, don't turn there, it says, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Paul understood that the man's heart was wicked. But Paul says in this verse, I see a principle. Paul is talking now about this battle that is between, that exists between the spirit of a man and the flesh of a man. Paul never understood this before because his spirit man and fleshly man were unified.
But now when Paul got saved, his spirit man separated from his fleshly man. And now Paul is trying to walk by spirit. But early in his walk with the Lord, I believe he was trying to dominate his old behavior by fleshly means. Paul had to learn willpower can't keep you from sin. Having a, all the commitments you want in the world cannot keep you from sin. The only way you have victory over sin is spirit-led victory. Paul is beginning to understand that. He said, I see the fight now. Look at him in verse 24. But I'm going to give you a quote from Larry E. Johnson. And the quote says, you will never come face to face with your true enemies until you change directions. You'll never come face to face with your true spiritual enemies until you change directions. As long as you're traveling in the same direction of your sin, you will never experience any resistance. But if you decide I'm going to go in the opposite direction of my flesh, your flesh is like a spoiled child. The minute you tell it no, you're going to exceed this battle like Paul did. Verse 24, he said, wretched man that I am, who going to set me free from the body of this death? Look at verse 24. That leaves Paul with a horrible conclusion, y'all. He said this, as long as we remain on earth, we're stuck in this body. We're stuck in this flesh and with this world. It's a part of our human condition. Now, many have never come to this conclusion. And why? Because we're traveling in the same direction as our flesh. A lot of, even some believers, still don't understand this battle. And the reason they don't understand this battle is because they haven't made any strong decisions to fight their flesh. They either tried and gave up, and then now they just succumbed to their flesh. I want you to try something in the next week. Take at least one area of sin, just one. Make a commitment to stop it, and then I'm going to talk to you after a couple weeks. And let's see if you know this battle Paul is talking about. Paul says in verse 24, wretched man. Paul is viewing himself, y'all, from a fleshly point of view at this point. He said in frustration, look, I'm trying to do right, but I'm always in this fight. You know, I try to take, I take two steps forward and one step back. You see this battle I'm in, y'all? This is a tough battle. He says like this, he says, he says, you know, I, I, I see it. I, I can't, who's going to get me out of this body? Paul is saying this fleshly body is always fighting against me. Then he answers that rhetorical question, y'all, in Romans 7, 25. Do you understand what Paul is saying? I think all of us, anybody who's truly serious about that Christian walk, has come to the same conclusions Paul has. Man, look, this life is tough. This life is hard. And sometimes I just want to release. Sometimes I just want to be out of this body and not have the same battles I do on a consistent basis. But look at Paul in Romans 7, 25. I thought he was going to leave it there, but he gave us some hope in 25. 25 says this, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Question, what's he thanking God for? Well, what did he just say? He said, who's going to wrestle me from this body? Then he thanks God. So he's thanking God that one of these days in the future, his spirit is going to detach from his body and the battle will be over. One of these days, his battle with the world will be over. One of these days, his battle with Satan will be over. Paul is looking forward to this day. So now let's go back to verse 18. It's going, we had to go there to give us some insight. Verse 18, chapter 8, 18. Romans 8, 18. He says, for I consider, now, that, now, now you, you, we just went over seven, and Paul talked about suffering as he fights sin. Now watch this. He says, for I consider, now let's take a word, look at that word consider. What's consider mean? Consider means to reckon, account, or when it's used in literature, it means to deliberate or conclude. This word, y'all, was used to describe a person who was counting money or settling debts. An account would use this word that has to calculate amounts owed or paid off. So it's a mathematical term. At least it started off that way. Now, when, it's a, when it is used in a non-mathematical sense, it describes deliberating or coming to some conclusions. For this first part, it says, for I consider 
Paul is not using this in a mathematical sense. He's not counting money. But in some sense, y'all, he's coming to some logical conclusions in his brain. He said, I'm, I've considered some. In other words, I've thought about some issues now, and now I've come to a settled conclusion. Now, in our modern vernacular, we might say, I've come to this conclusion. Let me use it in a sense. You say you love me, but you don't call me. You don't come and see me, and you don't respect me. I have come to the conclusion you don't love me. In other words, the conclusion they came to was based on weighing some facts in their head that proves a certain conclusion. Well, in the same way Paul is using this, he's, he's got facts in his head and experiences. He's got revelation from God in his head. He's got his own suffering and experiences. And through that all, he's come to some conclusions about all of it. Paul is saying this, over time, I've gone through some afflictions and some trials. I've seen this world. I've seen some wars. I've seen some death. I've seen it all. He says, I weigh those things against the revelation of God. In other words, Paul says, I look at all of the suffering that I've seen through God's word. And this is the conclusion I've come to. Let's move through the text, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings, uh-oh, got to deal with that word. Now, this word suffering is very broad. It describes suffering that comes on all humanity as a result of the curse of sin. Now, as Christians, we get some icing on the cake. The whole world, y'all, has got to go through suffering because of sin. But as Christians, we get even more because of our relationship to Christ. Are you following me? So the world going to go through some issues. The world is going to go through job loss, wealth loss, sickness, death, rape, incest, molestation, rejection, abandonment, broken homes, divorce, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, war, and finally global pandemics. This word encompasses all of these kinds of things, but for the Christian, it also encompasses persecution that Christians go through just for their belief and association with Christ. So Paul is saying this, y'all. Now that we understand what suffering is, I'm talking about all the stuff everybody goes through plus Christian suffering. Verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, you see that there? Notice that Paul says that I consider the sufferings of this present time. Question. Is Paul talking about in that moment? Or is he speaking of something much more broad? In other words, let me put it in other words. Does this word encompass both present and future sufferings or only present? Taking a look at this word for time will help us. Paul says, I consider, I weighed out the sufferings, all the stuff we go through of this present time. For us, that present time is COVID-19. So is he talking about just now or next year or two years from now for those who make it through? So we look at that word present and time. We want to look at present. We're going to look at time. In Greek, there are two words for time. Chronos, which means present running chronological time, or kairos, which means seasons or ages. In this text, Paul uses the second term which is kairos, which means seasons or ages. So let's look at this again. If Paul wanted to convey the idea that this text only pertained to right now, this second, he would have used the word chronos. In other words, he would say this present suffering for us that is COVID-19, for him is persecution, something that you're currently experiencing, he would use chronos. But he does not use that word. He uses the word kairos, which means ages or seasons. So now let's read it again, that whole phrase, and we'll paraphrase. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present age or seasons. Notice the difference. Look at it. Ages and seasons, start and ending time, are not determined by a clock. They are determined by God's providence or God's eschatological events. 
I just used the long word eschatological, which means God's last day events. I want you to catch that. In other words, seasons and the ages are not stopped and ended by a clock. They are ended as in, in, in a timeline of God's events. So in other words, kairos or seasons and ages is determined by God. We see this all the time in the word of God, where God determined that Israel would be enslaved in Egypt for 425 years. He determined that season of age. It was not going to let up until he said it's done. So in this case, Paul is saying it's not just chronology. He's saying it's not, not just this season of COVID-19. There's going to be other things coming after this. Paul is saying none of the sufferings now, next week, next month, next year, all the way to the future is what's in, is what's in light here. None of those. Nothing future is going to come against you if you know me as your Lord and Savior. So let's look at this. Romans 8, 18. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, y'all hear me now, the sufferings of this present time. Paul said, I thought about this thing, y'all. He said, they're not worthy to be compared. That word worthy means, basically, it's a word that means, refers to something of equal value or more value. Let me help you understand the word by analogy. When I played sports, my coach would, he would look at the schedule and see who the upcoming team we were going to play and he would pick a player on that team who I knew, and he would use him to motivate me in practice. He would say something like this. That point guard over at John Glenn is going to be ready for you. Or he might say, I think he might be better than you. You know, all my church folk know me. You know in my mind, you know what I was thinking. He's not on my level. When I say this, it was my way of saying that any comparison between me and him is invalid. So Paul is using that in the same way. Paul helps us see that we usually compare like things. Let me give you an example. When two things are close in value, beauty, or evil, we use comparisons to help communicate ideas. We might say something like this. Ford is like GM. Lincoln is like Cadillac. BMW is like Benz. They are alike in price, reliability, and looks. The only thing that determines this is your taste are the determining factor. We might also say this, Applebee's is kind of like Friday's. You might also say this, Trump and Hillary are about the same, right? Well, often in that in the election, people says I chose the lesser of two evils. So and they, 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 and we have comparisons like that. But here's what we never say. We wouldn't say this right here. Staying at the Super 8 is like staying at the Four Seasons in New York. We would never say a steak at Ponderosa is like a steak at Ruth Chris. We wouldn't say that because these two are invalid comparisons. We would never say for you young bucks that Lil Uzi is better than Big Daddy Kane. We would never use that comparison because we know that there's no comparison between the two. Now watch Paul here. Here comes the comparison, y'all. Look at the text. For I consider that the sufferings of this present age of season are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. It might help us, y'all, a little bit. Based on the knowledge we have of the scriptures now in the study of the text, let's rephrase or summarize Paul's text, y'all. Paul says this, y'all. Just imagine him sitting across the table. It's you and him having some coffee. He might say something like this. You know, I've been thinking about this thing for some time. I've been growing in this thing and, 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 and life experiences. And I've, I've experienced death and, of people close to me. I've, I've saw people die. I've seen people get their head cut off and, and be personal. I've seen it all, y'all. He says that I'm convinced that all the things we go through as part of our being Christians and humans don't compare what they don't compare to, Paul, to what? Watch the end of the text. The glory that's going to be revealed in us. What's Paul talking about here, y'all? Well, what's he saying? Oh, help him, help him. To the glory that's going to be revealed to us is what he says. Let's go back a little bit. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 through 4. It ain't but one book back to your left. No, to, to your right. Two books to your right. 
Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. 2nd Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 through 4. I'll give you a little time to get there. Listen to this. It's interesting. This is Paul talking, but let me just set a touch of context. The Corinthians have made claims against Paul that weren't true. They called him stupid, uneducated. They said he was preaching for money. And they said he lacked humility. So Paul then goes into this story. And he says in chapter 2, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. He said, I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. Only God does. He was caught up in the paradise and heard inexpressible words which a human being is not allowed to speak. Now look there. This citation is from the book of Corinthians, which was written in 57 AD, around that time. He said 14 years prior, this is what happened to a man. So if you take 14 from 57, you get 33. That's roughly about three years after Christ died. Now watch Paul. Paul switches from first person to third person. He was so humbled by this event that he switches to third person to describe the events. Look what he said. He says, I know a man who was caught up into the third heaven about 14 years ago before writing this letter, around 33 AD, around three years before the crucifixion of Christ. This was most likely a time when Paul was in the actual desert that God told him to go to, and it was just him and Jesus, and he was taught directly by Jesus. May have been around that time, may have been during that time. I'm speculating, but it makes sense according to the chronology. Paul says, I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. So I can't tell you if I was dreaming or was actual vision, which are two different things. He said, but what I do know is that the Lord gave me a preview of heaven. Now, let me give you an analogy for this. Y'all do know that oftentimes uh, movies, the way they get you hooked is with a trailer. They may play the trailer six months or eight months. And let me just say this off the record. I hate when they play trailers nine months before the movie comes out. Play it two months. They play it nine months and say this movie's coming out next year. But that trailer is just to give you a taste or foretaste of what the actual future movie is going to be about. So Paul says, I got took up to paradise or the third heaven. And he said, I heard things that are inexpressible. That word inexpressible means that I don't even know how to describe with any adjectives or words. He only said, no human being is allowed to speak those words. In other words, the, the, the language and what he saw and what he, what he heard was so much, he didn't even repeat it. He just told about the experience. This vision or dream left Paul absolutely speechless. Now let's go back to Romans. It's going to help us understand this a little bit more. Let's go back to Romans. Romans says this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. So y'all see the reason I went back to Corinthians now. I had to go back to Corinthians because this is the part where Paul is talking about his own experience. He says this, come on now. Y'all, I thought about this. And, I, and compared to all the things we go through, what you mean when we go through, Paul? Fighting, sin every day, sickness, death, turmoil, divorce, broken homes, disease, destruction, crime and war, all those things. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I know what you're talking about, Paul. Paul said, I've come to this conclusion. I came to this conclusion because the Lord let me see the trailer. I saw the trailer, y'all. I didn't see the whole movie, but I saw the trailer and I really can't even describe what I saw. He says this though, there's nothing on this side that even remotely compares to the glory that's going to be revealed to us on the other side. Have mercy. That, that's something to praise God for. Paul said, I, I, I've seen it. And in this case, by faith, we got to trust Paul. Paul said, I crossed over into the third heaven. And I saw the trailer of the movie. And the movie is far greater than anything that you remotely experience on this side. Here, y'all, Paul is talking about the second coming of Christ. In theology, y'all, we call this the finale 
of the eschaton. But before I jump to that, I want to take you back to the last phrase. It says this, to the glory to re be revealed to us. Now, I want y'all to know something. I had this scripture memorized before this sermon. It's a life scripture for me. I've had this memorized for about a decade. But I always repeated it like this. For I consider the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. But the actual text says this is the glory that's going to be revealed to us. Y'all, I was making a critical mistake. And here's why. Because we don't have any glory in us of our own self. It is going to be a glory that's going to be revealed to us, not in us. Because we don't have glory that we bring. The only glory we have has been given to us by Christ. So in this text, what he's promising, that you're going to see glory in heaven that you've never seen before. Now, y'all do know that there's two reflectors or multiple reflectors of light in the cosmos. But the two main ones we call them is the sun and the moon, particularly for our earth, for the earth. It's the sun and the moon. I'm pretty convinced you guys know that the sun is the source of the light, right, and stars. But moon does not give off light on its own. But if you go to night, you will see a big light in the, in the skies. Well, because the moon reflects the light of the sun. The Bible calls it a lesser light, but it is still a light. So in the same way, when Jesus Christ comes back and he reveals his glory to us, he is the source of the glory, and we are merely reflectors of his glory. And in this text, Paul is saying, I've seen the end of the story. I've seen the end of the movie. I know our final place that we're going to go after all this suffering. And he said, church, family, believers who know Christ, what you're going through, what we're going through now, what we may go through next week, what we may go through next year, what we may go through a decade from now, does not even remotely or can be compared right to the glory that's going to be revealed to us when we cross over. You see why now my objective at the beginning of this sermon was that our objective today is to get you to lose this world and begin to hold on to eternity. Paul is saying, don't find your comfort. Don't find your source of joy on this side. Don't find all your happiness on this side. You better come and look up to the hills from which comes your help and look towards Jesus because that's where your help comes. That's our final place. And you better trust Paul. Paul said, I've seen the trailer, though. Y'all, I've seen this movie. We got to trust that he knows what he's talking about. And he says this, when I look at what I've been through, and we're talking about a man that was beat. He was beat multiple times, laid at sea for several days, stabbed and killed and stoned, and eventually he had his neck caught off by Rome. This is a man who went through some stuff. Didn't have much. Sometimes he had money. Sometimes he didn't. Sometimes he had clothes. Sometimes he didn't. This is a man who went through some things in his life, and he said, all of this, none of this can compare to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Sometimes the best way to understand this is to take you back. Ladies, particularly ladies, when you had your first child. Earlier today, in this sermon, I talked about the pain of childbirth. The pain. Y'all, my, my wife, with Kennedy, may have been in labor for about 10 hours. 10 hours of contractions. 10 hours of pain. 10 hours of exhaustion. 2 hours of pushing, pushing, and pushing. But when Kennedy came out and our child came out, smiles came, tears flowed, all the pain didn't matter as much anymore. Why? Because the pain is worth the result. The pain of childbirth is worth the gift that comes out on the other end. The pain of childbirth is worth it so much you go through it that you all but forget the pain that you went through. And I can't help but remember, after we had Kennedy, it wasn't two days later, and my wife was like, wow, when are we going to have another baby? And I was laughing. It's like she totally forgot what she went through. In that same way, y'all, when we get to heaven and see God face to face, or when he comes back and gets his church and we go with him, 
I'm convinced that all the things we went through, we will look at them through light of eternity. We will look at them and say, it was worth us going through all of that for what we have now. It's worth all the pain, the struggle, the, 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 the death, the, the separations, the, the bad time. All of that's going to be worth it when we see him face to face. I know there are some here, though, who may not know him as their Lord and Savior. So I'm coming today for you. First, if you're listening and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the decision you need to make. I hear a lot of things now in the news that say, well, don't worry. Be safe. Don't worry. Don't panic. Don't have anxiety this time. That's the world's knowledge. Don't believe that. That's a lie. If you don't have Christ, you should be anxious. If you don't have Christ, you should be panicking. If you don't have Christ, you should be in fear. You need Christ. That's the only anchor. That's the only person who can give you rest and peace inside of a storm. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to make this decision. All I'm asking you to do first is, let me give you an ABC. The A is to admit that you need him and that you're a sinner. Stop sugarcoating it. Stop making excuses. Your mother and what your father did to you at this point are irrelevant in this action right here. You got to make a decision for yourself. Admit that you are a sinner and that you need God. Number two is B. You got to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross on behalf of your sins and three days later he rose from the grave. That is a faith belief. But we do have good evidence that he did die on the cross and rise again. So if you're here today, if you're here online today, and you hear this, you got to make a decision whether you're willing to believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins you just admitted in A. Then C is to confess him as Lord. To confess him as Lord essentially means that you say, Jesus, you are Lord. Lord means master. That means now you have a new master. It's no longer yourself and your flesh and sin. It is now Christ. Which means to say from this point on, when Christ tells me to do something, he is my new master and I'm going to begin to obey him. Y'all, if you're here today and you don't know that and you want that hope, you can have it. I pray all these things, Lord, as we close this service, that you might be glorified in what we say and what we do. Help us, Lord, to now look at our life and our future in light of eternity. Lord, I don't know what's coming up the street. I, know, I could not tell you, Lord. This, they say this thing's going to get worse. Lord, at some point it may begin to touch folks in my own family, Lord. And I know it may touch some people in our church family. Lord, I just got to trust you during this time. You said in your word through Paul that nothing we go through, nothing is worthy to be compared to the glory that you're going to reveal to us when we see you face to face. Amen. want to say though that was a good message pastor we thank you and speaking of being present with the lord i want to give a praise report out to my nbc family family no doubt you came and you gave from the heart from a place of what i call sacrificial love and we thank you i pray that we are able to maintain our giving with this level of love family this was last week in the midst of all of this, last week was one of the best weeks we had in our offerings. And again, we want to thank you for that. I want to read something David proclaimed in, as he thanked God. First Chronicles 29 chapter, starting at the 16th verse. And David said this, O oh Lord, our God, from your hand comes all this abundance that we have provided to build your house for your holy name. And all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the hearts and delight in uprightness. All these things I have given willingly and with an upright heart. And now I've seen, and now I have seen your people who are present here giving joyfully and willingly to you. Oh Lord, God of our father Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire forever in the intentions of the hearts of your people. 
and may you direct and may they direct their hearts towards you always. I, I, I can't say no better than David said. And this is what we want. We want to thank you for the giving. And at the same time, family, something else. We want you to contact us and let us know how we're doing in, const, in our constant contact. How we're doing with our online presence. We, we're asking you for your suggestions, ideas, and hey, if you like what you're hearing, email us and let us know. We love to be encouraged as best we can. And we'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock for our family prayer. God bless you, and I'll see you. I'll meet with you this evening in Jesus' name. Release us today in a benediction that as a church that we've been memorizing. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. And most certainly the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Amen.